My name is Anna Maddox and I play oboe and English horn with the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra. Today we're going to talk about what happens when your band director or your orchestra director asks you as an oboe player to play the English horn. So the English horn is the tenor version of the oboe and all of the fingerings are the same. So that should be relatively easy to negotiate. But there are a couple of big differences um, in the instruments. So the first is obvious that it's much bigger. And so because it's bigger, you're going to have a much bigger spread on your fingers. Some of you might actually have trouble reaching the bottom keys on the English horn. And if that happens, you probably are going to have some trouble playing the English horn and you need to tell your director that. Um, and they might need to find somebody who's a little bit taller to play the English horn. But you also might be able to work on stretching those fingers out so you can reach the keys. The hardest one is the low E flat key for most people. Something that can help. A neck strap. So the English horn is about three pounds generally. There are some instruments that are less heavy than that and some that are more heavy. But I find that a neck strap is very helpful. There are a few different kinds of neck straps you can find. So this one is an elastic neck strap. You see it's got a little stretch to it. That's my favorite kind. This one is actually for the oboe or for the clarinet. And this one is generally available in most music stores. So if I get the one that's for oboe or clarinet, what I do is I take a hair tie right here and I cut it and then I tie a knot in it and then I hook the hook for the neck strap through the hair tie and then that makes it long enough for me. The other option is that you can find the same kind of stretchy neck strap for English horn and it's got a little bit more length to it and then you don't need the hair tie. Then you can just hook the neck strap into the ring on your thumb rest. So if your thumb rest doesn't have a ring, most neck straps have a small leather piece that you can attach around the thumb rest and, and then it has a hole that you can thread the neck strap through. So look for that small leather attachment if your thumb rest does not have a ring on it. So then, the reed. The reed for the English horn is bigger, and so it's longer and wider than it is for the oboe, and therefore the crow is a little bit lower. And the other big difference that you'll usually find, not always, but usually, is that the English horn reed has wire. So if you can see that. Now, I make my own English horn reeds, so I get to choose which side of the wire you can see that it wraps around and there's a part that sticks out down here. So I get to choose which side I put towards my lower lip. And I as a player prefer for this side, oh, I'm trying to find the camera. There's the camera, sorry. I prefer for the wire side to go towards my lower lip. Now, some you're going to want to if you're buying your reeds from a store, you're going to want to experiment a little bit to find out which side you prefer and which side plays better. Sometimes one side or the other responds better than the other, so just check. The other thing you can check, especially if it's a handmade reed, is one side of the blade might be slightly shorter than the other side. This is really important to check. If you have that, if one blade is shorter than the other blade, the shorter side must go towards your lower lip. If you end up playing with the shorter side on your upper lip, the reed will not vibrate as easily and it will feel very difficult to play. So make sure you check that to see if one blade is shorter and the shorter side goes on your lower lip. So just like on oboe, you want to take as little reed as possible. But in general, I find you can let the reed sink into the lip just a little bit more. Don't be afraid about that. On the oboe, that will feel a little bit like you're biting the reed. On the English horn, because there's more surface area, you're not biting the reed. You're just letting the surface area cover more, and that's okay. Now, if you do have a reed with wire, the wire will move up and down sometimes. Sometimes it's got that plastic wrap around it, the fish skin or the Teflon tape, then the wire generally doesn't move. But 
If someone has handmade your reed and they put wire on it, the wire will slide up and down. You want the wire to just be up just as far as it stops. You don't want to shove the wire up so high that the sides of the reed start opening. That's not good. Then you will have a very difficult time playing in tune on the reed. The wire in general is there just to help with the resonance and the projection. It's not there to help with the opening. So that's a common misconception. You might think the wire helps with the opening of the reed, but it doesn't. So just be careful about that. Um, the other thing about English horn reeds is that very regularly they're a little too open. So if they are, make sure the reed is wet and then just gently massage your fingers down the reed like that and that will close it up just a little bit. That'll help. So the other big piece that's different than the oboe is the vocal. So the vocal is what the reed sits on and then the vocal sits in the well of the, of the English horn. And your English horn, assuming that you're borrowing one from your school, will probably have one or two vocals in the case. So which vocal do you use? Well, every vocal is a slightly different length in general. And usually makers of vocals label them with one, twos, or threes. One vocals are shorter, twos and threes are longer. So three is the longest, one is the shortest. Sometimes you'll have a vocal that has no number on it, and sometimes you'll see a vocal with a seven or a nine. So again, the smaller number is a shorter, and the larger number is longer. So if it's shorter, you'll play a little sharper, and if it's longer, you'll play a little flatter. But there is a big thing to be careful about. So this is a vocal that I do not use, but I do own it just to be able to show you this. <clears throat> And that is some vocals have a problem on certain notes where if you are playing the note and you are holding the note and you're trying to diminuendo suddenly at the very bottom of the note at the bottom of the diminuendo the pitch will sag really suddenly and very abruptly and there's like there's nothing you can do about it so I'm going to use this vocal to demonstrate this problem this usually happens on your two finger C or your fingered half whole C sharp. Those are the two notes that this generally happens on. So if I'm holding the C, do you hear at the end of that that kind of like sank just a little bit? Let me do it one more time, see if you can hear it. at the end it gets really flat for me that's a no-go if you have a vocal in your case that is doing that don't use that vocal use the other vocal hopefully that is not doing that now if both vocals are doing that obviously pick the one that you play more in tune on and just be careful about that don't diminuendo too far on a C or a C sharp so now I'm going to switch to one of my vocals that I know doesn't do that Here's the vocal that I generally play every day, and I'll show you the difference. So here's that C again. And you hear the diminuendo is just perfect, and I don't have any pitch change at the end of it. The most difficult note, on, especially for student English horns, is the low E. That's a little different than oboe, right? On oboe, it's generally the low D flat. That's the most difficult note. On English horn, it's the low E. Don't be surprised about this. That is a note on English horns that tends to be a little bit stuffy and hard to play. It feels a little bit like the low C sharp on the oboe. It's just something in the manufacturer. Not every English horn has this. So if you have an English horn that has a perfect low E, congratulations, lucky you. So the English horn is bigger. <clears throat> so that means you need to use more air when you play the English horn. And because it is in general a softer instrument, you're almost always going to be asked by your director, directors, maybe you have multiple directors, to play louder. That is very common. It is the most common thing that I've heard in my career as an English hornist is please play louder. 
So I practice a lot to use lots of good resonant air when I'm playing the English horn. So one of the best ways to do this is to actually take some pieces that you are already familiar with on the oboe and play them on the English horn. So I'm going to play um, an A2 that some of you may have already learned. It is the first progressive melody in the Barrett book. It's also the first melody you see in the Geckler studies. So I like to take this melody and use lots and lots of air on the English horn and figure out how to make it happen. that etude before on the oboe, go ahead and try it on the English horn. You're going to notice that it's a little different feeling to play it on the English horn, and that's a good thing. It's That's a great way to figure out how to negotiate this new instrument. One big fingering suggestion. If you have to play a high B flat on the English horn, you should either add the low C key or the ring finger on your right hand to that note. The low B flat, or sorry, excuse me, the high B flat tends to be flat on the English horn. And so this is the one like big fingering change between the two instruments. I never play a high B flat on the English horn without adding the C key or my ring finger. So here, I'm gonna back up a little bit so hopefully you can see this. Oop, can't get the camera here, I'm gonna stand. So I'm gonna play the B flat and then I'm gonna add them so you hear the difference. So here's the high B flat without, and here's with, and here's with the ring, and again without. So you hear that it is definitely flat without. So that's why I absolutely add that key every single time on every B flat I have, even in fast passages. So that's the only fingering difference. On the half hole, so this is a very big key compared to the oboe, right? Um, I've seen some students try to sit their finger way up here. No, nope. sit your finger right in on the, on the line right there, right in between where the key moves. And so when you have to go to half hole, you're just rolling your finger just like an oboe and then roll back. So it is a bigger motion. <clears throat> and a great way to practice this is actually to play C then just open the half hole, and it'll make that funky kind of sound, that like air sound, and then put the rest of your fingers down for D. That sounds like this. And then gradually do that slightly faster, and then slightly faster, and then slightly faster. And if you practice that in slow motion to begin with and then gradually get faster, you're going to have a very smooth half hole action. This will also help your oboe playing. It's a similar exercise, actually similar, it's exactly the same exercise that I do on the oboe to go over the half hole really beautifully. It's just that on the English horn that motion is a little bit more exaggerated. So that will help you as well. So, my key points on English horn playing are find the vocal that suits you and that plays in tune. Remember to use lots and lots of air. Don't be afraid to let the reed sink into the lower lip just a little bit more. And then take some of your favorite things that you play on the oboe and try them on the English horn in order to learn the instrument. Good luck, it's a fabulous thing to play. <laughs>